this series of lectures will cover acute medical conditions involving the renal system. So first we will go over acute renal injury. This refers to the abrupt cessation or decline in GFR. And as a result, the kidney has failure to maintain fluid, electrolytes, and acid-base balance. So obviously, compared to CKD, the uh, main keyword here is acute. So from the onset to the renal failure state, this can happen within a short period of time. Clinically, the diagnosis of AKI has very specific criteria. This list of three summarizes the diagnosis criteria. And one thing we need to know is that if we have any one of these three criteria, then that means the person is suffering from acute renal injury. So they do not need to have all three of them. They just need to have at least one. In the past, this condition was known as acute renal failure, which is also descriptive, but right now experts believe that acute renal injury is a better term that explains the etiology as well as the pathophysiology of the condition. So what can cause acute renal injury? So in this figure, when this was done, it was still called acute renal failure, but we know this is the same condition we're talking about with acute renal injury. So first we see here are the pre-renal causes. This means the condition that caused this acute injury to the kidneys has occurred somewhere upstream from or before the kidneys. So we see in this figure here, we see this renal artery um, that branches out to each of the kidneys, and this supplies blood to the kidneys. So this section here could have some sort of issue going on. So it may be interrupted by injury, illness, or say cancer. Uh, also, in the medical condition known as shock, uh, we mentioned this in metabolic illness, that there is severe decrease in blood pressure. So the, in that case, a lot of internal organs would not have ac adequate blood su supply. And we know that the blood is filtered out through the glomerulus, right? So the hyperfiltrate has a very similar electronic electrolyte concentration as in the blood. And if we do not have enough arterial blood entering the kidney, then obviously the glomerulus will not have enough material to filter. So that would lead to an abrupt decline of GFR. Then the second one mentioned here is intrarenal. So this refers to the damages or injuries that are directly to the kidney itself. These injuries could be caused by inflammation, toxins, drugs, infection, or reduced blood supply, which we've already mentioned. So as we can see here, a lot of these interrenal causes of acute renal injury, they may not be limited to the kidney itself. So we know things like inflammation and infection, that could be a systemic problem. For example, when we talked about sepsis and SIRS, all those inflammatory and critical conditions, then the damage to the kidneys could be just part of the multiple organ failure. So this is something we should keep in mind. Then the third category we have is post-renal. So post-renal causes. For example, we know that we have these two uh, ureters that go from the kidney down into the urinary bladder from both kidneys, so two ureters there. Um, but if we're talking about, for example, kidney stones, if they get dispelled from the kidneys but they get stuck in the ureter, um, 
then that would stop the flow of urine. So that would cause everything to back up. There would be congestion, and it, then eventually that would lead to the decline of GFR. Or a blockage here could be done by a tumor, or the blockage could be somewhere here in the bladder itself. So, um, you know, if we have a cancer or a huge tumor mass in the bladder, or say in men, for male patients, if this prostate tissue here becomes enlarged, and, um, you know, that can happen with cancer or just being related to the normal aging process, it could also disrupt the urine flow through the urethra, which is what dispels the urine outside of the body. So all of these places downstream of the kidneys that we just talked about um, are basically the route for urine flow out of the body, but many factors could disrupt this urine flow, and that could lead to the acute kidney injury. We already mentioned that no matter what we're talking about in terms of causes, what happens in acute renal injury is that there is a lack of blood flow to the kidney, whether directly or through secondary causes. And sometimes it's complete lack of blood flow, so that will lead to the reduction of GFR, which results in those ure uremic symptoms we already learned about in CKD. The progression of AKI has four phases. The initiation phase refers to the time when GFR after the injury starts to decline. And then it is followed by the extension phase. That is when due to lack of blood flow, ischemia and inflammation damage will occur and then persist. So if we recall this figure that we looked at, if the renal artery for some reason is not supplying adequate blood supply to the kidneys, not only will the glomeruli not have enough blood to filter to make urine, but also the survival of the tissues in the kidneys could be jeopardized as well, right? So um, think about, for instance, a heart attack. The coronary artery supplies the blood to the cardiac muscles to support the heartbeat. But in a heart attack, this becomes interrupted and causes the heart to stop. But in this case, for the kidney tissue to function, they need to get oxygen and blood from the arteries themselves, not just to filter it out to make urine. They also need the blood to support that tissue. So with that, we can understand why during the extension phase, we will see the continuation of ischemia caused by lack of blood flow and the inflammation damage associated with it. Then once a patient's GFR reaches its lowest level, that's what we call the maintenance stage. So at least we know things won't get worse. The GFR does not decline any lower than this. So at this point, we want to help the patient survive and then recover if they can. The last phase is the recovery phase. And we should understand that ARI by nature is an acute illness. It is not a critical, it, it is a critical illness. So what we learn in the critical illness module, a lot of that will apply here. So make sure that we understand the pathophysiology that's going into acute renal injury. Clinically, due to the disruption of fluid and electrolyte balance, we will see a lot of lab values of these electrolytes being off the charts. And we'll have the accumulation of nitrogenous waste. And also, malnutrition is common. People will go through wasting. And as for any critical illness, the requirement for energy is elevated. So this is due to the nature of the altered metabolism. And critical illness patients go through negative nitrogen balance. So the protein in the body begins to break down.
However, remember at this time, we're talking about acute renal injury. So the nitrogenous waste from that protein degradation cannot be disposed of adequately. And this is why we see a wasting of lean mass. But this is also why we see nitrogenous waste being quickly accumulated in the system. Usually the minerals we want to monitor are potassium, magnesium, and phosphorus. Often they are elevated. However, there are conditions when the magnesium and phosphorus could decrease. For example, in the phase of refeeding syndrome, which we mentioned when we talked about nutrition support, specifically parental nutrition support, this can this is a condition that happens in long-term malnourished patients that are receiving additional nutrition support. So as a result, the body will go through anabolism and that will lead to the entry of the magnesium and phosphorus from the extracellular fluid compartment to the inside of the cells to support the synthesis process. But this means that the concentration of these minerals in the blood could drop significantly in a short period of time. Sometimes it may become fatal, so that's what refeeding syndrome is. Please review if necessary. Also, with malnutrition and diuretic therapy, these two labs could drop as well. When we talked about the support of critically ill patients, we did mention that especially for multiple organ failure patients, we may need to use mechanical ventilation. And also the use of CRRT, continuous renal replacement therapy, as a part of life support for these patients during that critical period. People on CRRT tend to have low magnesium and phosphorus levels. So these electrolytes should be monitored frequently and actively for these patients. Also BUN and creatinine levels are usually elevated. So we already explained why this would be. But we need to keep in mind that our goal is to keep BUN at the range of 80 to 100. So that's something we need to know as a target. To treat acute renal injury, we first need to target the underlying cause. So exactly what is the cause for this in a particular patient? Is it a stuck kidney stone? Or is it an enlarged prostate? Is it a bladder tumor, for example? Or could it be from systemic shock with very low blood pressure? So definitely we need to address the root cause. Nutrition therapy will depend on the type of dialysis patients are going through. So CRRT provides continuous dialysis and this allows the body to get rid of about one to two liters of fluid per hour. So it's a very efficient support. And like all dialysis, that will have a nutritional impact, so we need to closely monitor everything. When we talk about nutrition therapy, we need to understand, or at least review again, that renal disease itself can put a patient at risk for malnutrition, and the medical treatment could then increase this risk further. So this is something to keep in mind for either acute or chronic renal failure. And we mentioned earlier that the pathophysiology and the progression to the different stages of acute kidney injury resembles that of metabolic stress. So that we have covered in detail, please review again if necessary. So we are treating AKI as a critical illness. And if we're talking about nutrition needs, depending on what the precipitating event was, the percent of the increase in protein and the energy requirements can really vary. And of course, um, you know, if the patient is catabolic, 
So like people who are undergoing, you know, metabolic stress, um, they often go into a catabolic status and no matter how much nutrition we can provide, sometimes we just have to let the body run through its course before it hits bottom and can begin to recover. Based on the current practice guidelines for AKI patients, protein restriction is not a component of care. So this is different from chronic renal patients where we closely monitor protein intake, especially in CKD stages three and four, we really need to reduce down to a little bit of protein intake to the level slightly below adult DRI. However, for these acute patients, it is not a component of care. Therefore, we should remember that we should treat AKI, AKI as a metabolic stress and as a critical illness. And our priority is to provide nutrition support. If with the precipitating event and the resulting renal failure, the patient's body cannot deal with the protein provided from nutrition support, then we will put them through CRRT and do the continuous dialysis. We prioritize providing nutrition support over restricting protein intake because patients under this condition are going through catabolism. And also, the intake levels of vitamins and electrolytes should also be considered based on our monitoring um, of the lab values and functional tests to see exactly how bad the renal function is. Also, fluid intake depends on the residual renal function. And same as CKD patients, people on hemodialysis and peritoneal dialysis, we will also need to closely monitor a lot of lab values. So a lot of them are electrolytes and minerals, and that will determine their daily need based on their serum level. So that's the same principle here for acute patients. We want to closely monitor the serum and urine levels of these elements and electrolytes, then decide exactly how much they need for the moment. So we've seen this big table on nutrition recommendations for renal patients before. But before, we only really focused on CKD stages as well as hemodialysis and peritoneal dialysis. But for this lecture, what's relevant here is this column for acute kidney injury. So let's just go through a couple of them to see the difference. Well, for protein requirements, for patients who are not catabolic, we are going to provide 1 to 1.3 grams of protein per kilo. So this is higher than the adult DRI, which is consistent with the management of critically ill patients because they need more protein. And if they're on CRRT and they are hypercatabolic, then we can provide more protein if necessary, up to 2.5 grams per kilo. So 2.5, that's 300% of the adult DRI level. Then the energy is based on nutrition status and on stress. So the difference here in this column compared to the rest of these columns over here is the stress, right, the critical illness. AKI, the pathophysiology and the nature of the condition is different from CKD. So we need to understand that. And also, if we move down to look at the electrolytes, um, a lot of them, a lot of the recommendations is given under certain conditions. So if the serum level is low, um, then we will provide a certain amount. If it's the other way around, we'll change the recommendation. 
So this also indicates the necessity to monitor a lot of labs very frequently, sometimes on a daily basis. And for you know being a dietitian or intern, we can request certain labs if you think it's really necessary to see the information before you prescribe or adjust the nutrition recommendations.